the entire teaching of Advaita Vedanta can be summarized in one verse, in one shloka, hmm? that is traditionally attributed to Adi Shankaracharya. Hmm? Brahma Satyam, hmm? Jagan Mitya, hmm? Jivo Brahmeva Naapara, hmm? it means. Brahma Satyam, Brahman is real. Brahman alone is real. <coughs> Jagat Mitya, the world is Mitya. We can translate Mitya by unreal. It's actually neither real nor unreal. The world is unreal. And there is a third part of this uh, equations mm, that has been confirmed and asserted by um, Bhagwan Ramana Maharshi mm, that you can also find in elsewhere in Shankaracharya uh, works and that is that the world also is Brahman mm, since all is Brahman the world is also Brahman mm, so that this is the triple equation uh, Brahman is real the world is unreal, but the world is also Brahman, is also real. And then the second part of this um, uh, traditional um, shloka, hmm? the individual self, the soul, the jiva, hmm? Brahmeva na apara, hmm? is non different than Brahman. It means the soul, the individual self, is divine. It is also Brahman. And this is a great news. Hmm? It is very much different um, from the teachings of the monotheistic religions in the West, huh? like Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, hmm? where there is a sort of gap between the creature and the creator. Hmm? Not a complete gap, because the mystics of all these traditions in the Kabbalah in Judaism or the Christian mysticism or Sufism in Islam have experienced directly the divine and have realized the divine. Hmm? But there seems to be a gap. Hmm? Though in the first book of the Bible, the Bereshit, it is mentioned that man or the human being was created in the image and the likeness of God. Hmm? So right from the beginning, it is asserted that uh, the human being is divine by essence. In the Greek Christian tradition, it is said that the purpose of this life is divinization of the human being, the theosis, the divinization. Hmm? But in Vedanta, we say that the individual soul cannot attain Brahman because the individual soul is Brahman. Brahman is not attainable. Brahman is the essence of the individual self, hmm? soul. Hmm? Now, how to uh, realize this divine essence, the beingness of the individual soul. Hmm? And this is the great message of the Vedas, huh? especially in the Vedanta, the end of the Vedas, the Upanishads, huh? which has been written like less than 3,000 years ago. Hmm? The seers, the great rishis, have realized that. Hmm? And they have pointed huh, to the right direction where you have to look and explore yourself and that is the consciousness. The consciousness as 
the witnessing consciousness within us, mm? that which is perceiving everything, and remains ever unperceived. Because consciousness is not an object, so you cannot perceive it. It is that in which, upon which, all the objects, all the experiences are perceived. So, this witnessing consciousness, which is an aspect of the dynamic consciousness, the manifested consciousness, is that which allows knowledge, experience and knowledge in us. It is the uh, cognition or cognizance uh, principle in us. Without that consciousness, witnessing consciousness, no experience can take place. No knowledge, empirical knowledge can take place. And what is actually witnessed or experienced? Basically, there are three experiences, three scenes, we would say. The body, the body is witnessed in this consciousness. The mind means all the contents of the mind hmm? and the world. Hmm? The world appears also in your consciousness. The world is witnessed. Let us see the mind. Hmm? Our mind is going through different states. Huh? And the three, the three hmm. basic states of the mind are the deep sleep, hmm? the dream state, and the waking state in which we are presently. Hmm? When we are in the dream state, we dream of a world uh, where there are also uh, pains and, and pleasures. Hmm? We call it the dream world. Hmm? Once you come out of the dream, you realize that the world you have dreamed of was not really there. It was a creation of your mind. It happened only in your mental consciousness. It's not really there. And so you, when you wake up from the dream, you lose interest in the pursuits of that happened in, the, in this um, dream world, because you know that uh, it's not really there. And the same thing happens when you explore more and more, you investigate about uh, the world that you experience in the waking state. We are running after objects, after forms, because we believe that they are separated from us, that we are the subject and there are objects around us. And either we um, are attracted by these objects or there's a repulsion, mm? there's an avoidance. Mm? Until you come to realize that nothing is separated from you. Mm? All is actually appearing within your own presence, within your own consciousness. It's like bubbles on water. Mm? We are the water, we are the consciousness. Mm? So the bubble was never separated from water just an aspect, a fluctuation, a modification of water. Mm? So when you realize that, mm, you lose interest in any pursuits, in any worldly pursuits, because you are the water, you are the essence, you are everything. Mm? Now, <coughs> this Witnessing consciousness in us, the witness, we call the Sakshi. Hmm? Sakshi Chaitanya, the witnessing consciousness. Huh? It is that which, as I said, allows cognizant, experiential cognizant. It is the, the knowingness within us. Hmm? So it is a sort of conscious subjectivity. Hmm? So automatically, hmm, whatever is witnessed, whatever is perceived in this conscious subjectivity, 
becomes a sort of object, an object of consciousness. Mm? So there is a subtle duality here mm? between that which is perceiving, witnessing, and that which appears in consciousness. Eventually, we come to the realization that there is no duality. Mm? There is no, on one side, the seer, that which is seen, and on the other side, that which is seen. Mm? But it is important to adopt for some time this differentiation mm? to overcome the confusion that happens at this level. The confusion is that we have taken ourselves to be what we are not. Mm? What we are, our true essence, is this witnessing consciousness. Oh, this witnessing consciousness is the first expression of our true being. It is witnessing because it appears through the mind. The witnessing consciousness never appears alone. It is because it is reflected through the mind that it is witnessing. So this witnessing consciousness is the very first expression of the infinite consciousness. Mm? Now, this witnessing consciousness mm, is our innermost conscious subjectivity, mm? the primal subjectivity. Mm? And it is associated with the mind. The mind, the antakaran, we call in Vedanta, that is the inner organ. Uh, it has a function. And the function of the mind is to process the data coming through the uh, senses of perception. The mind is there, it's like a software to process all the perceptions, the outer perception and the inner perception, the sensations. Uh. The mind will process that. Uh. Uh, the mind will um, store all the, uh, the memories of the experiences, mm. again, for a function purpose. Mm. So there are different aspects in the mind. There's also the intellect. Uh. And there's a huge memory mm. of past experiences. Mm. Now, all this appears within this witnessing consciousness. Mm? The mind, as I said yesterday, is totally inert, just a software. There is no presence in the mind. Huh? Like when you play chess, for instance, with a computer, mm? the computer can win the game. Huh? But the computer is not conscious that he is the winner or the loser. Mm? There is no presence. There is just an, a mechanism, mm, an intelligent mechanism, a logical mechanism uh, that is totally inert, insentient. Mm. There is no knowingness in the computer. Mm. <coughs> so in the same way, the mind is insentient, but the mind is illumined by the consciousness. Mm. That is very, very important to understand, to realize that. And you have to confirm that for yourself. You have to make the difference between the mind and the consciousness. You can see your mind in the same way that you can see your body. You can see all the contents of your mind. And all these contents, that is what we call the mind. Like the thinking process the emotions, the past memories, and then, of course, the, the perception to the five senses that also come to the mind, and the inner sensations. Mm? Beside that, there's nothing else. Mm? That is what we call the mind. Mm? So all these um, arisings, uh, you can definitely witness them. Mm? And again, that which is witnessing cannot be perceived. It is the ultimate perceiver. There is no um, 
there's no other consciousness behind that can perceive this witness within you. This witness is final. There is no um, other consciousness behind. So when you are witnessing your mind and your body and, and the whole world, you actually abide in this witnessing consciousness. Now, as I said, this witnessing consciousness creates a center of conscious subjectivity. And around the age of 18 months or a little more, mm, an I will be associated with this uh, subjectivity, mm, the aham. Mm. And then from the aham, uh, attributes will be associated to this aham. Mm. I am this, I am that, uh, aham idam. Mm. And then the whole personality uh, um, is built mm, and will grow. Uh, and, and it's here that the identification happens. Somehow, this witnessing consciousness forgets itself. Mm? That witnessing consciousness is limitless. Mm? It's an expression of the infinite consciousness. Mm? Somehow, that witnessing consciousness mm, gets identified to the contents of the mind. Mm? And, and first of all, with this sense of I, the I-ness, the ahamkara. Mm? And it seems that this is programmed. Mm? It is inherent to the uh, human condition. Mm? We call it the um, ego principle. Life is built in this way, that an ego will appear. Mm? And this ego is purely transactional. It is to help this sentient form to deal with other forms, to deal with the outer world. You need a sense of I to take care of this body. If you have no sense of I, the body will perish. The body will be in danger. Mm? So there was never anything wrong hmm, in the, uh, the rising of this I, the I-ness. It's part of the, the unfoldment of life. Hmm? It's absolutely natural. Hmm? But then, as a side effect of this uh, mechanism, hmm, there's a complete identification to this I and all the attributes of the I. And the, the source, the essence, uh, um, is completely overlooked. And because of this contraction of consciousness, uh, there is suffering, there is frustration. Hmm? So this I is, in a way, the cause of the problem. And at the same time, it is the solution. Because if you come back to this I and you abide in the consciousness uh, aspect of the I, then you are bound to realize your true essence, the source of everything. Mm? If you drop all the attributes of the I, uh, and you abide in this conscious subjectivity, that means the witnessing consciousness, you are bound to realize the consciousness. Because there is no difference between the witnessing consciousness, mm, the Sakshi, and the infinite consciousness, chit, that is Brahman, hmm? sat chit ananda.
It is Brahman appearing as the witnessing consciousness. Now, this witnessing consciousness is what we call Atman. It is the deepest level, if we can speak of levels for the sake of clarity. Hmm? There are no levels, but we have to use these um, categories for the clarity of understanding. Hmm? This deepest level of our being, that is the witnessing consciousness, is what we call Atman, the Self. And the great <coughs> message of the Upanishad is that this Atman, your innermost Self, hmm, is the supreme reality, is Brahman. They are not two. They are one and the same reality. Hmm? Everything appears in this consciousness. Hmm? Everything is a modification, a frequency of this consciousness. Hmm? So there is no really an outer world. The world that you see is only a modification in your consciousness. As well as the inner world, the mental world, is also a modification in your consciousness. So consciousness is all there is. Mm? And it is inclusive of everything that is perceived. Mm? So now you understand the importance of self-inquiry or any other practice that brings you back to this I-ness. Hmm? <coughs> when you abide in the sense of I, hmm? prior to all the attributes, prior to the personality, prior to any story, hmm? You become the witness of this life. And this is already a blissful experience. It requires some effort in the beginning, because there will be always be the um, tendency to go back to the identification and to be, again, the personal subject of your life. But to due practice, uh, you can really abide in the effortless uh, witnessing. Mm? And this is a blissful experience. Mm? It is <coughs> sort of a preliminary state mm? um, that is preparing or um, preceding the complete awakening. The awakening, again, as I explained yesterday, is when this witnessing consciousness, where you still have a subtle duality, mm? it creates a center of subjectivity, mm? when this witnessing consciousness recognizes its own source, that is the absolute consciousness. In the absolute consciousness, there is no witnessing. There is no seer and there is no seeing. All is absolutely one. And this can be realized while we are in this uh, human condition. And at the same time, at the level of this human condition, the witnessing is going on mm, as a function of life, mm, an expression of life. Mm. So as the absolute consciousness, as Brahman, you are not really the witness. You can't differentiate yourself with anything that you perceive. You are the mountain, you are the tree, you are the animals, you are all the beings. 
You are absolutely everything. And you are not located anywhere. You don't have the feeling that what I am is here, in this body-mind. Hmm? You are everywhere. Hmm? And since this human body is still there, hmm, and the mind is functioning, we can also uh, witness the world. Hmm? So the witnessing is still there when you realize your true self. And that is a function of life. Hmm? As long as this human being exists, hmm, the witnessing will take place. Hmm? So a sage, a realized sage, hmm, also uses the pronoun I hmm, to point to this human body. Hmm, to this personality. Mm? But at the same time, there is no identification with this human mind or body. Mm? It's just a transactional, operational I mm? for the sake of communication, for the sake of navigation in this world. So the realized sage mm, knows that what he or she is, is absolutely everything, whether with form or no form. And at the same time, he or she is also this body-mind, temporarily. But there is no contraction here. There is no exclusive identification. So there is no experience of that, hmm? because that consciousness has no birth and has no death. Hmm? It is timeless. It was never born. Hmm? So abidance in this I-ness, in the sense of I, is most essential to recognize what we are. Hmm? So <coughs> this search starts very much with the, with the ego. Mm? We call it the upper part, the higher part of the ego. Mm? The intellect, the sadvic uh, part of the ego. Mm? The seeker. Mm? We start as a seeker, as a practitioner. Mm? And the only thing we can do as an ego mm, is to remove what stands in the way. Mm. But as an ego, as a mind, you can never understand nor realize nor recognize what you are. It is not the mind that recognizes the source. It is consciousness itself which was for some time identified wrongly uh, with the contents of the mind that again becomes conscious of itself. So this is not the work of the mind. But as we are identified with the mind, we can also use the mind for this noble purpose of awakening ourselves. And through understanding, right understanding, right practice, right effort, we come to the effortless recognition. If we cannot now recognize what we are, definitely we need a practice. And the amount of practice is very different from one person to another person. 
for some seekers, just hearing the truth uh, is enough. Mm? And for other seekers, they need 20 or 30 years of practice. Mm? It all depends on the intensity of the search mm? and the ability to understand what we are and the detachment from the objects of the world, the forms that appear in your country, the detachment from these forms. You are not the forms, you are not what you see. You are the seer. So we need a certain level of detachment, of dispassion. So this is very much asserted in the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, the Gita says that we need dispassion, viragya, and also practice abhyasa. It is also mentioned in the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali. If the recognition is not spontaneous, mm, is not actual, mm, then we need detachment and we need practice, mm, right practice. The right practice is to abide at the source of ourselves, in our innermost presence, which is untouched by the vrittis of the mind. Hmm? It's not about stopping the mind. You can't do it, or you need many lives of yogic practice to stop the mind. And to stop the mind, again, that would be a state of the mind. Because you cannot stop the mind forever. You need the mind, you know, to, to live this life. Huh? The mind is an instrument. Mm? You don't have to stop the mind. You have to witness all the modifications of the mind and detach yourself from these modifications. And attach yourself in a way to that which is seeing. Mm? Don't associate yourself with anything that is perceived. Mm? associate yourself to that which is perceiving. Mm? Remain the neutral witness. Mm? Live this life, live in the world without touching anything of the world. It is called the yoga of non-touching. Asparsha, Asparsha Yoga. No? It is mentioned in the uh, Karika of Godapada, the Grand Guru of Adi Shankaracharya. Mm? Live in this world as if you are just a visitor. Mm? Again, this is the teachings of mindfulness. So mindfulness is not just about uh, abiding in the witnessing. It is much more than that. If you abide in the witnessing, your life will be completely free from any stress. Your life will become very comfortable. But you may not know who or what you are. As the witness, you still don't know who or what you are. Hmm? And there are many seekers, after hearing these teachings, suddenly they abide effortlessly in this witnessing. It's very beautiful, it's blissful. Hmm? But they still don't know who or what you are, and there's still a subtle anxiety about tomorrow, whether I will remain in this blissful state of witnessing. Mm? When I go back home, I go back to my profession. Mm? When I again I live a family life uh, with all the tensions 
hmm? whether I will remain in this witnessing. Hmm? So it means that there is still a sense of ego there in the witnessing. Huh? And yet, when you abide for a certain time in this witnessing, through grace, because you can't do anything when you are in the witnessing, there is no sense of doership, huh? through grace, hmm, suddenly consciousness is revealed to itself, by itself, in itself. And this is called awakening. So when you are in the witnessing, there is always the risk, if we can say so, to shift back to the identification. Hmm? When strong vasanas pop up in the mind, huh? and all tendencies, very strong tendencies, huh? then again you are in the individual personal story. You are in the identification. Huh? It's a complete fall huh? from heaven. <laughs> but once the recognition happens, uh, when consciousness reveals itself to itself, uh, this is irreversible. You can't go back to the identification. It's not possible. It's like falling down from, from the stage. Uh, you are playing in a, in a piece of drama on the stage, and then somehow you fall from the stage, and you realize, oh, I was an actor, hmm? but I'm not really the character playing in this drama. Hmm? Then you become free from the story in the drama that's going on. You can never go back there. Hmm? It's like when you realize, when you wake up from the dream, that the tiger hmm, was jumping on you and you thought you would die. Uh, only when you wake up from the dream, you know that there was no tiger, really. Hmm? And that you are alive. You cannot die there, uh, because the tiger jumps on you. Hmm? So you can never go back to that story, because you know that this tiger was uh, a sort of illusion. Hmm? So in the same way, as we wake up from the dream, we can also wake up from the waking state and be free from the story, the scenario hmm, of the person. central practice hmm, of the seeker of truth in the tradition of Advaita is abidance in the innermost self, which is the witnessing presence, and remain there. Hmm? So this innermost self is the real guru. When we cannot connect with the innermost self, then we need an outer guru hmm, for some time. It's like a guide, a pointer, hmm, a monitor hmm, to help us to connect with the inner guru, that is our own presence, our own self. Hmm. So this inner presence takes care of us. This inner presence is ever present. It's never separate from us. We have separated ourselves from this presence by forgetting it and being identified to the data of the mind. Are there any questions so far? Yes, please. Mm. 
Yeah, the judgment you refer to is very much at the level of the person. So the mental consciousness, the identified consciousness, the associated consciousness. Huh? At the level of the witnessing consciousness, there is no judgment. There is nothing to compare also. Nothing to evaluate. There is only isness, beingness, you see? No, I would say it is the opposite. Huh? The fear of being judged or the tendency to, to judge others, that is a, a result of the identification. Huh? Identification takes place for a, a functional reason that is beyond our understanding. It is the choice of life that when this is witnessing consciousness reflected in the mind, identification takes place automatically. Hmm? It's a choice of life. Life has chosen this way. Hmm? But through right education, we can be free very soon from this undue identification. Hmm? It is needed for the growth, the education of the human being, but by the age of 18, you can be totally free from this identification and the belief that you are this body-mind to right education. The problem is that we get stuck in this identification see, for the entire life. And we believe that we are, that we are not hmm, the person. We are the consciousness in which the person appears. Hmm? And this consciousness is free from all the problems of the person. Accidentally, this person appears in your consciousness. It's an accident. Could have been another person, <laughs> another, another set of um, vasanas and, and, and datas, you know, mental datas. Consciousness is not personal. And the witnessing consciousness here is the same like the witnessing consciousness everywhere, where you have sentient beings. <coughs> it is the same in nature. It is only one witnessing consciousness, not seven billions on the planet. It is one consciousness witnessing through seven billion sentient human beings. It's very much impersonal. Hmm? To be identified to the person is a burden, but it takes some time to come to this conclusion. Because there are people they don't want to be free from the person. They like to be this, they are very much attached and identified to this person. They don't want to hear these teachings. Hmm? They want to be free from suffering, but they don't understand that this path of liberation goes through the disidentification with the person. So these teachings are not meant for all. They are meant for the sincere seeker who is ready to lose himself or herself, to drop this belief of being such or such. If you don't renounce to yourself, you can't know yourself. You know yourself only in the absence of yourself.
So you can lose only what you are not. But you are, you can never lose.